All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series. This is the third exam in our sixth edition series. As always, if you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A behavior analyst is analyzing data for a client who engages in aggressive behaviors. She notices a consistent pattern. Aggression occurs immediately following the removal of preferred items. The analyst concludes that there is a predictable relationship between the removal of items and aggression. Which philosophical assumption is the behavior analyst demonstrating through this conclusion? When we get assumption questions and dimension questions, we want to be very aware of what the question is asking about because we have to be very precise. The question wants to know the assumption that is demonstrated through the conclusion. Because if we think about the behavior analyst analyzing data after observation, that may be empirical, right? She's using data, she's using observation, she's making these decisions with this data-driven decision-making process. But her conclusion says, there's a predictable relationship between the removal of items and aggression. And when we conclude that there's a predictable relationship for why behavior happens, what assumption is exemplified there? A, empiricism. Well, like we talked about, there is some empirical things going on in this particular question, but we want to know about the conclusion itself. Selectionism. Now, selectionism is selection by consequences. We aren't quite sure what the actual effect is of the consequences, right? Because we just know there's a relationship between the removal of items and aggression. What that relationship is, we're not quite sure. Parsimony is the simplest explanation. And we're not looking at the simplest explanation here. We are just making a determination about why behavior is happening. And so the conclusion is exemplifying determinism. Behavior happens for a reason. Why is the aggression happening? Well, because the items are being removed. Behavior is happening for a reason. If we were going to go with, let's say, selectionism, we would look at this behavior over a long, long period of time and draw a functional relationship, let's say, between the consequences and the aggression. But here, we're simply determining that the aggression is happening for a reason. After two losses in a row, a basketball coach meets with his three assistant coaches to discuss potential changes they can make in practice. Several suggestions are offered up, but the coach wants to be as empirical as possible and choose the best suggestion to not complicate things. How should he do that? So our coach here wants to look at these different ways they can change practice. And he has a lot of different suggestions, but he wants to be empirical. So he wants to take all these suggestions and be empirical. Well, how do we act in an empirical way? Well, we observe and we take data and we remain objective. So let's look at A, implement one coach's suggestions at a time and track and observe performance data over the course of a week. Yes, if we go one at a time, we can control for confounds and we can track and observe through observation and data collection. That is an empirical approach to this problem. B, apply all changes at once and then track and observe performance data over the course of a week. Why is this not empirical? Well, if we apply all changes at once, how are we going to know exactly what is making the change? Yes, we're observing. Yes, we're taking data. It's just not the most empirical way. C, survey the players on what suggestions they prefer. This is indirect assessments, which is not as empirical as our direct observations. And then D, rely on experience and choose the most parsimonious suggestion. Well, relying on experience and being parsimonious, being parsimonious is important, but just relying on past experience is not being empirical because experience, we're not taking into account our data and our observation. So how should you do that? Implement one coach's suggestion at a time, track and observe performance data over the course of a week. Following a functional assessment, Antoine identifies that the student of interest is disrupting the class only when the teacher has not called on them within the last 15 minutes. What goal of behavior analysis is Antoine demonstrating here? So we have a goal question. 
Our goals are description, prediction, and control. With description, you are just describing what is happening. So description would say, Antoine says, the student is disrupting the class. Prediction, we are making a correlation. We're hypothesizing. So the prediction is, Antoine says the student disrupts the class when the teacher has not called on them. That is its prediction. Control is when we do an experiment and establish a functional relationship. Antoine is not yet experimenting. He's simply making his prediction because he's correlated the student's behavior with not being called on. Each time a student talks out of turn in her classroom, Miss Rebecca gives the student a certain look and says, are you done? Which stops the talking. Over time, Miss Rebecca only needs to give a look and students stop talking. The look is considered a what? Now, what aspect of behavior are we looking at? We're looking at Miss Rebecca and the look. In what context does the look happen? Well, when a student is talking out of turn, Miss Rebecca gives a look and says, are you done? And what is the result? The talking stops. So this is punishing because it's decreasing the behavior, some sort of positive punishment. Now, over time, Miss Rebecca only has to look and it functions as a punisher. So what has the look become? A, an unconditioned punisher. Well, it wasn't unconditioned, right? Because at first she would give the look and say, are you done? Over time, she doesn't even have to say, are you done? Because she's paired that with the look. And now the look is just a conditioned punisher on its own. It's been conditioned to have those effects without, are you done? It can't be automatic because it is socially mediated through Miss Rebecca. And it isn't negative because Miss Rebecca is adding the look to the environment. So the look after pairing is considered a conditioned punisher. Every morning at 4 a.m., David gets up right when his alarm clock goes off in the morning. When Saturday comes around and David does not set his alarm clock, David usually sleeps until about 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. David's behavior relative to the alarm clock is impacted by what? So whose behavior are we looking at? Every time we get a behavior question, who are we looking at? What is happening? We're looking at David. David's behavior relative to the alarm clock. So what do we know about this? We know in the morning at 4 a.m., David gets up when the alarm clock goes off. The alarm clock goes off, David gets up. Saturday comes, no alarm clock, David does not get up at 4 a.m. So David's behavior is most affected by what? Well, the alarm clock. If the alarm clock is set, he gets up early. If it's not set, he sleeps until 8 a.m. So the main driver of his behavior is that alarm clock. So what could we say about the alarm clock? A, stimulus generalization. Well, we don't have really generalization here, right? We're talking about a very discrete set of events where we've got getting up and the alarm clock. So generalization is not necessarily playing a role in this question. What about stimulus discrimination? Well, David isn't discriminating necessarily between stimuli. His behavior is just under stimulus control of the alarm clock. His behavior is clearly changing in the presence or the absence of that clock. If the alarm clock is present, his behavior functions one way. If the alarm clock is absent, it, it functions a completely different way. So David's behavior is under stimulus control of the alarm clock. A behavior analyst is designing a behavior intervention plan and considers two possible explanations for a student's noncompliance. Either the student is engaging in noncompliance due to a history of reinforcement for escape, or the student is refusing tasks because of underlying psychological conditions. The analyst first chooses to address the reinforcement history before exploring potentially complex psychological issues. What assumption is illustrated most? All right, another assumption question. Again, let's think about exactly what we know and what the question is giving us. We know the analyst has two explanations. So immediately we're looking at explanations, right? Either the student is engaging in noncompliance because of the history or because of an underlying psychological condition. And then the, the question specifies the psychological issues are going to be complex compared to the reinforcement history. So essentially, the analyst is going with the simplest explanation first. So what assumption is illustrated most? A, pragmatism. 
pragmatism. We are we are using our available knowledge to make the best decision possible. Now, the analyst isn't necessarily using knowledge to make the best decision possible. He's simply trying to address the simplest thing first. Determinism. Yes, behavior happens for a reason, but the analyst has multiple reasons or explanations why the behavior might be happening. So he's not being very deterministic. He's trying to get there, though. See parsimony. This is what the assumption in this question is illustrating, the idea of parsimony. Let's go with the simplest explanation first. Instead of going through complex psychological issues, let's look at reinforcement history. And then if that doesn't solve our problem, we can get more complex. Parsimony is all about the simplest explanation first. And then empiricism, we're not looking at data-driven observation quite yet. Good chance the analyst gets there, but that is not exemplified in this particular question. You have to just use what the question is giving you. And what the question is giving you is a very parsimonious approach to this problem. The manager of a restaurant that serves breakfast and lunch starts to notice that his waiters are showing up later and later. When the manager asks the chef why this happens, the chef says that the waiters that show up late avoid having to do any opening work. This is true. What assumption is most represented by the waiter behavior? We have another assumption question, and that might happen, right? It is not our job to think about the order of the questions, or we've got this many questions in a row from this category. I've picked B six times. All that stuff is irrelevant. Your only concern is answering the question that is in front of you. That's all you care about. So let's answer this question. Let's be very careful. The assumption most represented by waiter behavior, because we have different things going on, right? The manager notices that the waiters are showing up later and later. The chef says that the waiters show up late to avoid having to do any opening work, but we're looking at the waiter behavior specifically. So we think about A, empiricism. The waiters are not being empirical, right? The waiters are not collecting data and observing and making decisions based on that. There's no empiricism going on with the waiters. The waiter behavior, however, is being selected by consequences. Why? Why would the waiters continue to show up later and later? Well, the consequence is to avoid having to do any opening work. So the waiter behavior is being ontogenic, and their learning history is selecting their behavior. So selectionism has to do with selection by consequences. And since we're looking at the waiter behavior, this is selection by consequences. Determinism. Well, the chef is being deterministic, right? Behavior is happening for a reason, but we're not looking at the chef's behavior. We're looking at the waiter's. And the waiter's behavior is maintained by these consequences. And then pragmatism is using our available information to make the best decision, the most rational decision. We're not looking at pragmatic behavior here. We're simply looking at waiter behavior, which is maintained and selected by consequences. The assumption here is selectionism. John Ralphio is always tapping his pen on his desk. He does this even if told to stop or if he is alone in his own home. He's unsure why he engages in this habit. What is the behavioral explanation for why this behavior persists? What? How might you describe a habit in ABA, because you know a habit is going to persist through reinforcement. We're, the habit is something we're doing day in and day out. And why would a habit continue? Why would John Ralphio always tap his pen on his desk? He's told to stop. He's alone. It doesn't matter. He's tapping, 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 tapping. Why would we, or how would we as behavior analysts describe this behavior? A, socially mediated positive reinforcement. B, socially mediated negative reinforcement. Well, immediately we want to rule that out. Why? Because we know even if he's alone, it happens. So if he's alone, nothing, the consequences cannot be socially mediated. And we need to rule those, op these, those possibilities out. So it's either going to be automatic positive reinforcement or automatic negative reinforcement. And that tapping of the pin, he's adding that to the environment. So clearly, the behavioral explanation for this habit is automatic positive reinforcement. Remember, we always want to be behavior analytic in our descriptions of these common ideas like habits. A clinical study involving mice found that just 20 grams of sugar significantly altered how the mice responded to external stimuli. 
Tony is curious if the same effect will be seen in humans, so Tony designs a multiple baseline design and starts to recruit participants. Tony is going to engage in what? What is Tony doing here? What is Tony engaging in? We know so far that the year is a clinical study with mice. So when you see studies with mice or animals or pigeons in a controlled environment, we're thinking experimental analysis of behavior. When we take those results or we try to take those experiments and use those experiments with humans, that then becomes what? Well, that then becomes applied behavior analysis. The key really difference between ABA and experimental analysis of behavior. Applied behavior analysis is, is a natural it's not always a natural setting, but it's with humans, right? In an applied environmental setting, right? It's with humans. We're applying it to human behavior. Experimental analysis of behavior is much more controlled, typically with animals. Behaviorism is just our theoretical approach to behavior. And professional practice is when we take all this knowledge we gain through ABA and EAB, and we apply it to our clients. In this case, Tony's applying this fi these findings and is experimenting with humans, so she's going to use applied behavior analysis. Which of the following answer choices does not represent radical behaviorism? All right, we have a not question. And so meaning three of these will represent radical behaviorism. Radical behaviorism says public and private events are both behavior. They should be included in the analysis of behavior. The only difference between those two is the observability. Let's look at A. A teacher considers a child's verbal complaints as well as observable crying when planning for their tantrum behavior. Well, this is clearly representative of radical behaviorism, right? The teacher is considering all these public events. Verbal complaints, observable crying seems very much like radical behaviorism. B. A teacher changes their lesson plan based on how the reward for completing a task impacts student behavior. Okay, right? Operant conditioning, operant behavior. Nothing about B conflicts with radical behaviorism. C, a coach evaluates an athlete's performance in a game as well as how the athlete felt during the game. That is very radical, right? These athlete private events, the coach is taking into account. D, an analyst develops the behavior plan focusing only on staff's outward and observable actions while ignoring the staff's thoughts. This would be the least radical out of all these answer choices, right? We're not going to ignore thoughts and feelings just because they're private. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe on YouTube. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out or card. Study hard. See you soon.